Colossians 3. I have, I have laid this sermon out the best I know how, as simply as I know how, to talk about a believer's new life. Someone may say sometime, do I, do I really have a new life? Does Christ really live in me? What, what are the signs in the scripture that I'm a new believer? And then break it down for me. Just give me step one, step two, step three. Say a few words about it, and then let me just compare my life to it. And not only do I know him, now that I know him, am I appropriating the resources that he has made available to me in this new life, or am I just flat living in rebellion and disobedience to him? And if I am, do I care? Stand for the reading of God's word. It's a marvelous attendance for a school out week, and we're glad you're here. Beginning in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, King James says, uh, if or translate since, seek those things which are above, why? Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's the indication that I know Jesus Christ. I died. I identified with Christ. And my life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, covetousness, which is idolatry. And covetousness is always wanting more. It can fit into the context, too, with not wanting to do what you ought to with what you've been given, and it's idolatry wonder who ever thought as a Christian that when an offering plate's passed and we choose to be disobedient that we've committed the act of idolatry. I mean, I thought idolatry was get you a niche in the side of a marble wall or a wood wall and put you a false god there and bow before it. Oh, no. No, it's not that complicated. It could be as simple as week by week disobeying God. I mean, volitionally, you know better and you just choose not to do it. And what you say is, I will rule my life, therefore I'm God, and that is idolatry. Wow. And so he brings it down. Then he says in verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. He's talking about someone that's been brought out of this life, and one thing's for sure, if he did what he needed to do to get me out of it, God forbid that I want to slip back into it. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The believer's new life. In this passage and that to follow, there's a practical and ethical emphasis as Paul encourages and exhorts his reader, listen to this, to give an outward expression in daily living to the deep experience that is theirs in Christ. In other words, something's happened in me. I am to live out or work out my own salvation in daily experience. Now, the Bible says that the Christian life is hidden with Christ in God, and that is incredible truth there. But it's still a life lived out on earth. So the Christian must therefore give attention not only to his outward experience with God, but also to his outward relationship with his fellow man. This relationship that I have with God is lived out in front of others. Augustine called it the city of man versus the city of God. I have now placed my residency permanently in the city of God, but until I get there, I'm to live it in the city of man. And I, oh, there's so much to say about that. Although Christians exist in this world physically, Spiritually, we are already citizens of heaven. Paul put it this way, writing to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 2, verse 5. He said, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved, raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, present tense. All of this is possible as a result of you being saved, born again, Repenting of your sins, believing the gospel, placing your faith in Jesus Christ. The power that raises believers out of death and makes them alive is the same power that energizes every aspect of the Christian life. 
Now, Paul wants us to see that our spiritual growth, joy, and fruitfulness require that we maintain a proper perspective on this world. So until we realize that basic truth and live it, we will be ineffective in reaching the world with the truth of the gospel. A.T. Robinson, Mikey Law called me not long ago and said, man, he's famous here at Oxford University. He was a Southern Baptist. They refer to A.T. Robinson as one of the greatest Greek scholars that ever lived. And for whatever reason, someone gave me his books early, early on. He's meant a great deal of speaking into my life. He speaks of the Christian as having to keep his feet upon the earth but his head in the heavens. He does not mean that we should never think about the things upon the earth, but that these should not be one's aim, our goal, or our master. Instead, there will be this difference. From now on, the Christian will view everything against the backdrop of eternity and eternal perspective and no longer live as if the world was all that mattered. So this will obviously give us a new set of values. So this passage unfolds the truth that serves as a starting point for practical holiness, the life of being set apart for Jesus Christ, and clearly displays the power of heavenly living on earth. Now, I've got time for one major point today, and then the Lord willing, Sunday week, I'll preach the second part. But here's what I want to ask this morning. Okay, we're talking about a believer's new life. Here is the question. What produced this life? And then, in two weeks, Lord willing, I will preach a message entitled, What This Life Produced. What produced this life? Something produced this life. But, what does this life produce? So this morning, what produced this life? I'm going to give you, I think, five thoughts. Number one, being dead with Christ. You see it? You got your Bible open there? Look on with your neighbor. It says, for you died. Eris tensed speaks of a past act, and here would be the question this morning. And I want you to take a mental, a mental trip with me. When? Go back in your mind's eye, and let's put that aorist tense to work. When in your life? If you were to stand before God today, you've heard the question, he would say to you, on what authority should I let you into my heaven? What would you go back to in your life to say, like this, Alfred and Debbie Joyner here this morning. Debbie was the first person to ask me if I wanted to get saved. Alfred discipled me. And they can tell you, they've heard it enough, they were there. They were there. I have, I have, I have firsthand witnesses in the service this morning that on Sunday night, January the 7th, night, snowy night, just like I said, you named the horse correctly, I slipped out of my seat and went forward in the best I know how I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins, to save me and come into my life. Aorist tense, past act, I'm telling you, look at me. I got saved. By the way, this ought to encourage you. Your preacher is a Christian. I got saved. Past act. Now, that's where it all started. And by the way, listen to me. Don't get confused. There has to be a starting point. That's what produced the life. That night. A sinner came at the mercy of God, Jesus Christ alone. I was with some people from the Middle East this weekend, and they said, we want to tell you about how we baptize. They said, we bring someone into the water, normally a, a, a reservoir a, or a river, and they stand them there and ask them, have you repented of your sins? And they said, yes. Have you placed your faith in Christ alone for your salvation? Yes, I have. Are you saying to this group of witnesses that from here on out, you're going to live a life for Jesus Christ? They said, yes, and they're ready to baptize them. And they said, without exception now, in this Middle Eastern country, they said, hold just a minute, and I'm also willing to die for him. I've been crucified with Christ. When were you crucified? Johnny Hunt, when did you get on the cross with Jesus? Theologically, historically, before the foundation of the world. Experientially, January the 7th, 1973, what he declared became a reality in time. What he did in eternity became a reality in time. I got, I got on the cross. Stay with me. This is a fulfilled condition or assumption. When it says you have died, it means you can take this for granted. I died. 
It means that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 was talking about people like you or I, if we can say what I've said. Therefore, if anyone is, wait a minute, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I was out of Christ, but I got in him. He got in me. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Present tense is passing away. And all things have become new. So in what sense has the believer died? Now, I want you to stay with me, please. In what sense has the believer died? In the sense that the penalty for sin has been paid. But wait just a moment. What is the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is death. Therefore, if the wages of sin is death, for me to get out from under its penalty, I must die. But how can I die? I die with Christ. That's why tonight, sometime in the service choir, up there behind you, somebody will go into the baptismal waters. Why did Jesus Christ ask us to do this? And by the way, the first public act, you've heard it through the years, the oldest gospel record we have is Mark. The very first act of Jesus Christ when he begins his public ministry is not a sermon. The first thing Jesus Christ does when he comes on the scene is he gets baptized. Why? Because he said, I have come for this purpose, to die, to be buried, and to rise from the dead. And then he teaches the fact that we're going to be able to identify in his righteousness through his death. And so basically he's saying the wages of your sin is death, Johnny Hunt. You've got to die. And someone may say, oh, that means you're going to die a physical death. You won't buy our spiritual death. That's not what it means at all. It means that I need to die. So how did you die, Johnny? By union with Jesus Christ. By union with Jesus Christ, we die the required death in Christ. Thus the penalty of sin is paid. And listen, and sin can never claim us again. Did you hear what I just said? Sin can never claim us again. Oh, it may have its skirmishes, and there may be some battles we'll lose, but it has no right to me. It cannot claim me as its own. So we died to sin in the sense of paying its penalty. Now, let me just be clear so you can say, wait a minute, help me get clarity here. Its presence, sin, and power, sin, still affects us. Can I get a witness? The three of you, the rest of you, God bless you. But its presence and power still affects us, but it cannot condemn us. It has no claim over me. It only can do so much and no more. And it doesn't even have to do that if we let the power of God's Holy Spirit make us overcomers. So here it is. I want you to hear me again. If you can't identify with what I just said, that you can say that there was a time in my life, past tense, I died with Christ. Nothing else I say matters. You may say, well, what would you recommend we do? Just start repenting now. Saying, God, show me. I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell. And I'm just going to repent the rest of the sermon. And here's what you ought to be saying too. Hurry up and give the invitation. Because I can't do anything until I get this settled. And you don't have to wait. You can get saved and just by trusting Christ right there in your seat and then just make it public in the invitation given. Number two, now I, I died with him. Did I just stay in death? It's, no. I've not only died with him, I've been raised with him. You see it in verse number one? If you were raised with Christ, I am crucified with Christ. Here it is, Galatians 2.20, nevertheless I live. Well, wait a minute. Which? Did you, did you die with him or are you alive? Yes. I died with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I'm telling you, I, my sin was nailed to the cross. And then I've been raised with Christ. You know what the Bible's teaching? Listen to this. Death brings life. Really? Now, since that's a supernatural principle, does God ever teach that same principle in the natural? Oh, he sure does. And in the natural realm, the Bible says in John 12, 24, save a grain of wheat, fall in the ground, and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruitfulness. And you know what I found? You know one way I know that I've died? I led Donald Pope to the Lord. He's a pastor. I led Rex Clark to the Lord. And he sings in the choir and he's crying now because he cries every time he hears the gospel because a heart that was hard has become tenderized by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he can hardly even think about what Jesus has done. And so you know what? I'm not going to have an empty-handed because a man that dies don't go empty-handed because when he dies, he starts bringing forth fruit. 
And the only people that are going to be even thinking they're going to heaven empty-handed are those that have probably never died. I died. I just, I don't know, you know, there's, I can't see everybody this morning. I hear you breathing and I know you're out there. But is there anybody here that died? Have you been raised? New life within demands new life without. So as believers, we entered into Christ's death. But I was, I did, I was not only buried with Jesus Christ, I was raised with Jesus Christ. I, I have identified with his spiritual baptism. Literally tonight, literally in a figurative way. <laughs> you say, which one? Both. You'll see someone go into a pool tonight and they'll say, this person is coming. You know what you're in the baptism pool for? Do you know what you're being baptized for? To identify with Jesus Christ. What are you going to identify with? Well, we're going to say, uh, you trusted him and said, yeah, we're going to put him under the water. And sometimes if like you wait a long time and we know it for a fact, we hold you under longer. <laughs> just, just kidding. And so, and, and they're saying, and, and if you're sitting out here and, and you're a child and you've never seen this before, you say, where'd they go? They put them under the grave of the water. And then in a moment they come up, what does that identify? They're raised. So tonight, you know what we're going to do? You can come tonight and literally and figuratively see the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a believer. I identify with him. Hey, if he did that for me in the Jordan, I'll sure do that for him in that heated pool. To live on another plane. So somebody says, you know, that man, that woman's not the man or woman they used to be. Well, the reason is, is because Jesus Christ has come to live inside of them. They've identified with him, and he's taken them to a new plane. The Bible say, would say you've moved from one level of glory to another. Listen to Romans 6, 3. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Yes, I know that. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. Well, the reason you walk in this new life is because number one, number one, I've died with Christ. So all sinful passion now is controlled and conquered by the power of the indwelling Christ and our union with him. Now let me just mention this quickly and I'll move to a third statement. In the first four verses of chapter 3, Paul emphasized the centrality of Jesus Christ. But notice this, he says it five times in four verses. You can just look at verse 1, he says, with Christ. Verse 2, I mean, verse 1, where Christ. Verse 3, with Christ. Verse 4, when Christ. Verse 4, with Christ. What are you saying? It's Jesus everywhere. Number 3, I'm being seated with Christ. The Bible says in verse 1, now I'm where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Well, let me tell you what's so neat about that. Listen to Colossians 2, 3. I'm sitting where, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. I have, not only have I been resurrected with him, did you know this? I've ascended with him. I am in a place of access to my father who is my mediator, and the Bible says he's the only mediator between man and God. The only. So you're listening to a narrow-minded preacher this morning preaching about a narrow-minded way and that is the only way to the Father is through the Son. And he has only one mediator, which means bridge. It's also where we get our word from the Latin, priest. Only one bridge, and Jesus Christ is that bridge. The Bible teaches in Timothy 2.5. So I have access to our mediator, and let me tell you what's so cool about this. He sees both sides clearly. You know, sometimes I'm trying to make a decision, and I've got him as the very wisdom of God in whom all wisdom and treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him. Everything I need to know and do. I have the mind of Christ. And anytime there's something I don't understand clearly, he has a way of bringing it all together so I can understand it, so I can make rational decisions to bring glory to him. So I'm seated with him. But then number four, uh, I am being hidden with Christ. Now what in the world does that mean? I love this right here. Now stay with me. Your life is hidden with Christ 
in God. Why would I have more security in the bank that holds my money than the heaven that holds my salvation? Your life is hidden with Christ. Now, this carries a double suggestion in the Greek New Testament of these two words. He's, he wants you to understand safety and concealment. Now, where are you going with that? All right, I'm going to use three of the simplest words I can, and I'll explain it, and I'll do it in a timely fashion. First of all, secrecy. There is a family secret that the, the outside people that are not part of the family don't quite understand this secret. Listen to it. And Jesus Christ even referred to it. Now, just as Christ is now hidden from the eye of the world. See, I've never seen him. I've been a Christian 35 and a half years. I have never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Never seen him. So Jesus Christ is right now, 21st century, hidden from the eyes of the world. The Christian's life in Christ, my life in Christ is hidden. Stay with me. It is hidden to the lost because no unsaved person can understand the mystical identification of the believer's life in Christ. That's why we ought to be a gospel witness. Someone says, well, I, I'm just going to live my life and let them see Christ in me. Let's see what Jesus Christ says about that. John 14, 16. Jesus speaking, I pray the Father and my Father, he will give you another helper, parakletos, the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him and it don't know him. You've got him, you know him, you can't see him, but they don't know him or see him. But you know him. He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you. He's saying, I'm telling you something secret about this. I have come to live in you. They can't see me or know me. Number two, it also speaks of security. Believers are eternally secure. Did you know that once I get in Christ, my life is hid with Christ in God? The only way Satan can ever get me out of his grip is to become more of a dominant force than he is. Hey, folks, let credit be given where credit is due, but don't give him credit that's not due to him. He's the prince of this world. Can I remind you that Jesus is the king? Do you know your order? 1 Peter 1, 4 says that I have been saved to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. Where is it? Where is my, my salvation? Oh, it's reserved in heaven for you. Well, who's keeping it? Oh, it's kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. What for? Ready to be revealed in the last time? There's no question of doubt there. He's got it in the bank of glory. It is being kept by God's omnipotence. It's laid up there for me, and he's got it reserved until the day he's going to present it. He's never lost one. He's never lost one. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. When the Bible talks about saving us to the uttermost, it means he can save you completely and forever. If you're not careful, Christianity will be like your suit. You'll take it off today and you won't mention him or think about him or pray to him or spend time with him until next Sunday. And you'll get him and say, okay, way of life, let's go do it. It's a shared life. Jesus Christ not only brings life and gives life, but it is in himself that we have life. I am the way, the truth, and I am the life. Christ is called the believer's life because he is. He is the essence of his life. And may I add, even in death, he is our life. Now, I made that statement because something came to my mind when I was writing this sermon. Even in death, Christ is my life. Have you ever heard that verse? I read it at a cemetery many times, Revelations 14, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord in the Lord. This is a verse that I prayed all morning. Romans 8:10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, listen to this, to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I experience his life. I've had a week, and I bet you have weeks like this where I came and heard 12 sermons. I left here and I went and spent about 10 hours with some Middle Easterners to talk about what Jesus is doing in that region of the world. I came home to my friends. I have three families staying with me at my home. So I delighted in that. We all went out for dinner. Here's what I'm trying to say. I've not had much time to slow down. And I've felt a little tired this morning. And I bowed my head and I lifted my palms while the choir was singing. And I prayed something like this based on that verse. I give you my weakness. Give me your strength. I confess my sins. Cleanse me. Fill me with the Spirit of God. And Lord, not just fill me spiritually, but take this mortal flesh and dwell within me and give me power to preach. And I just want to make a statement. I'm feeling pretty good. God helps us. The key, one other statement, the key to living the risen life is to have a life centered on Christ. The Son of God, not this present world, is the center of the believer's universe. Jesus Christ is the center of your life. And then I'll give you one last statement, and then I'll quit, and I'll come back in two weeks, God willing. The fifth statement is, I'm being raptured with Christ. The latter part of verse 4 says, then you will appear with him in glory. The words that are used in verse 4 mean to make the visible the invisible, or the invisible the visible. When Christ returns, the real position of the believer which has been hidden to the world, will be made known. And this is a picture of being glorified with Christ because at the rapture when God takes us up, it's going to be in that time frame that we're going to be glorified with him. He's going to give me a new body like his, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2.